Hello and welcome to the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group webinar series and I'm pleased to have this webinar host the new Bean Group and I will hand the mic over to Dr. Guy Ginnon and uh, to, to introduce the speakers. Thanks very much Grace, thanks to all of you for being here and thanks to the thousands of people watching this on YouTube as well. Welcome to a webinar hosted by the Integrated Multiscale Biomaterials Experiment and Modeling Group. We are a portion of the IMAG that is focused on relating uh, experiment and theory. We're very pleased to have with us today Jeff Holmes from the University of Virginia. Jeff is uh, an investigator known to many of us. He is uh, at uh, he, he is a, a recipient of many prestigious awards, including the Fung Medal, and he's known to us as, as really one of the experts on interactions between mechanics, function, and growth, and remodeling in the heart, especially the infarcted heart. He's famous for his results showing the effects of anisotropy and isotropy in these wounds, uh, in wound healing of the heart, and uh, is also an emerging leader in the field of cardiac resynchronization therapy. We're very pleased that he's here to share some of his results and ideas with us. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much, Guy. Thanks uh, to the group for the opportunity to present. So, so uh, the title today is Multiscale Modeling of Scar Formation Towards In Situ Design of Better Scar. And as Guy talked about uh, in the introduction, the scar that I've been particularly interested in over the years is the scar that forms after a heart attack. So nearly a million Americans suffer a heart attack every year. Um, the good news is most survive. But despite available therapies, risk of developing post-infarction heart failure remains high. What we know is that the mechanical properties of the scar tissue that forms and replaces the muscle that's damaged during the heart attack is critical to everything else that happens. Pump function, remodeling, risk of heart failure. Um, but we've known that for a long time, and it's proven remarkably difficult to design therapies that improve LV function or prevent remodeling by modifying that scar. And so that's really what we set out to do in my lab. Um, and I wanted to tell you about three pieces of this. The first one is to establish a design goal. So what scar is it that we want if we could make any scar we want? And actually remarkably little of the work in infarct healing has been done starting with this question, but I think it's the natural place for us to start today. And then a little bit about the natural history, what scar normally forms after a heart attack, um, and then into the modeling and how can we use models to design interventions in order to change the scar that you normally get into the scar that we would want. So a little bit of heart physiology. Uh, for those of you who recognize these things, these are pressure volume loops. It's a common way of looking at pump function of the heart. Uh, so moving along the bottom of one of these loops, the heart first fills with blood, then it generates pressure, the aortic valve opens, pushes blood out into the aorta, and then it relaxes and fills again. Uh, and this is a fantastic modeling study by Dan Bogan from more than 30 years ago, where he asked what, what would happen if you made the infarct stiffer. And so right after an infarction, the main uh, problem is that the infarct is too soft, so the damaged muscle can't contract. And, and that really hurts you here uh, in systole. So you can't generate as much pressure, you can't generate, uh, eject as much volume. Uh, the, the damaged region bulges as the heart generates pressure and so you don't get forward flow out the aorta. And what Dan predicted and has since proven correct in many, many different studies of polymer injection and surgical reinforcement, other possible treatments, is that if you make the infarct stiffer, the systolic problem will get better. A stiff infarct won't bulge very much and so you will be able to eject more blood from the heart. But at the same time, filling will get worse because there's a stiff area in your heart and now it's harder to fill it. Um, and what Dan predicted uh, was that these two uh, effects would exactly offset each other, that no matter what stiffness you picked for the infarct, you would never be able to get better pump function. You would simply be trading uh, filling for pumping and you would come out even, so you would never have better function. And that's pretty much where things stood for about 30 years um, until, actually a little bit more than 30, until um, some of the work that we were doing, which I'll tell you about today, suggested that 
simply think of an infarct as stiff or soft was far too simplistic that infarcts can be highly anisotropic. Um, and armed, sorry, with that uh, information, we did a more sophisticated computational model to sort of repeat what Dana had been doing, but including the effects of anisotropy. So this is a finite element model of the infarcted heart. Uh, this is in continuity and environment developed by University of California, San Diego. Um, here we can control fiber orientation in the damaged region, so we can have circumferential fibers, longitudinal fibers, and we have control of the strain energy function that specifies the material properties, so we can make something that's very stiff in the fiber direction or very soft in the fiber direction, any combination that we want. And so we basically just explored the parameter space of different amounts of longitudinal stiffness and different amounts of circumferential stiffness in the scar, and this red diagonal line across the figures is the modeling experiment that Dan Bogan had done before, which is isotropically stiffening the scar. And so in agreement with Dan and other experimental uh, evidence that has confirmed his models, uh, as the scar gets stiffer, we see that we get smaller systolic volumes, means better pumping, but we also get smaller diastolic volumes, which means worse filling. Uh, and if we look at the difference, the stroke volume, over on the right hand side, basically across an entire range of physiologically plausible parameters for scar stiffness, there's no difference in stroke volume. So exactly as Dan had predicted, we're trading uh, pumping for filling and we don't come out ahead. What was new here was that our models predicted a little sweet spot over here on the left hand side in a red circle that if we could make a scar that was very stiff longitudinally um, but not stiff circumferentially that we could substantially enhance ventricular function and uh, I'll preview a point that's coming later in telling you that this structure longitudinally stiff scar has never been observed in any healing infarct in nature um, so this is an interesting opportunity if it holds up to do something different from what nature does that can improve pump function now of course that's a model prediction um, my original Original background is as an experimentalist and so I never believe it until I test it. This is the test um, which we did and published uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, so we took a Dacron patch, we cut slits in the patch that are parallel. So now if we pull in the direction of the slits, uh, this patch is much, much stiffer than myocardium, but if we pull across the slits, then the slits gap open and so there's very little, little resistance to deformation. Uh, and so what we did, these are in dogs, uh, is we measured uh, a cardiac output curve, so cardiac output at different filling pressures that's shown in black over here. This is a normal response uh, in the heart. Then we made a large infarct. Um, which substantially depressed that cardiac output curve. One way to see that is that the cardiac output at a matched end diastolic pressure has been reduced to about half. And then we sewed our longitudinal reinforcement uh, onto the surface of the infarct and saw that we could recover about half the deficit in just 10 minutes, um, which is by far the most dramatic improvement in pump function in an acute infarct setting that anyone has been able to demonstrate with a therapy. Um, others have done the isotropic a version of this experiment with surgical reinforcement and found that they can't get an improvement in pump function with isotropic reinforcement. All right, so, so we have a design goal now. We know that highly anisotropic scar that's stiffer in the longitudinal direction can dramatically improve pump function of the heart. Uh, and one way to get that reinforcement is surgically, as we showed you, but uh, probably a better um, long-term way to get that is to think about how the scar normally forms and see if we can redirect it. And so now I'd like to tell you just a little bit about what normally uh, forms uh, in these healing infarcts. Uh, and the answer to that is, it depends on the animal model. So the first two animal models that I happened to study in my career, the first one was pigs. Um, and so we studied healing pig infarcts using a standard model that many other people had used. Uh, and we spent more time looking at the collagen structure and mechanics than others had. And we found that at three weeks, we got histology that looks like this. This is a, a section of the infarct. It's cut parallel to the epicardial surface. It's stained with picker serious red. And you see that all the collagen fibers are lined up uh, in one direction and they're very highly aligned with one another. Um, now on the left, if I plot histograms of the collagen fiber orientations at different depths through the wall. This tallest one in the center is at the mid wall. That's the picture that I was just showing you. Most of the collagen fibers are oriented at zero degrees, which is circumferentially on the heart. As we move into other layers closer to the outer or inner surface, we see that the average moves a little away from circumferential, but the peaks also spread out. And so when I look at this overall set of histograms across the wall as an engineer, what I see is the vast majority of the collagen fibers are 
between plus 30 and minus 30 degrees, which means they're set up really to selectively resist deformation in the circumferential direction. And sure enough, if we look at the mechanics, in those same hearts, uh, we arrested the hearts, we put markers in place so that we could track deformation across the wall, and we inflated them to typical diastolic pressures. And here we see that as we inflate, there's very little strain in the circumferential direction, less than 10%. But in the longitudinal direction, there's substantial strain uh, up to about 40%. And in fact, this is more strain than we're getting in that same heart in a remote area of undamaged muscle. So, so roughly, um, this is softer or at least more deformable uh, in the longitudinal direction than, than the undamaged muscle would have been. Then we moved to rats. Uh, we had some good reasons for moving uh, to rats, but, but right away we got a surprise. So we thought we were just going to map out um, the development of anisotropy in the rat infarct so that we knew how to line up the time course with what we had seen in the pigs. And what we instead found out is that as collagen content increased, um, that's shown on the left, that we expected, but the collagen contents overall are about half of what we saw in the pigs. And the degree of alignment is nothing like what we saw in the pigs. So these are average histograms now for a number of rats. Um, and clearly these are quite flat, one week, two week, the blue is three weeks. By six weeks, my, my student Greg was trying to convince me that we were starting to see a little anisotropy uh, emerge. Um, and my answer was to plot my pig data on top of his rat data, and it looks like this. So, so clearly, the degree of alignment that we saw in the pigs is completely different from anything that we were seeing in the rats. And sure enough, when we tested uh, the rat infarcts in a biaxial mechanical stretcher, we found that they're mechanically isotropic as well as being structurally isotropic. All right, so the first two animal models we happen to look at, completely different story about natural healing of the infarct. They both form scar, but the structures are very different, the mechanics are very different, and that obviously raises the question of, of why this is. Can we get some hints about what's controlling this from uh, the differences between these animal models? And so there are a number of differences other than the fact that they're different species. Um, the standard model in the two different animals happens to tie a, a different branch of of coronary artery, uh, the coronary circulation, and so as a result of that, um, the pig infarcts tend to be closer to the equator of the left ventricle, and they tend to be long and skinny. They run longitudinally on the ventricle. The rat infarcts tend to take out the apex, so they tend to be more circular um, and in a different place uh, on the heart. Um, and one of the clues that we had is, as a mechanics group, we had been tracking mechanics in all of these uh, infarcts, and basically found that the mechanics, both acutely and later during healing, were different in the two groups of animals. And the bottom line is that the, the rat infarcts at the apex were stretching similarly in the circumferential longitudinal directions, whereas the, the pig infarcts were not. They were stretching primarily in the circumferential direction. Um, and so we thought this might be what's directing the scar formation in these different animals, but, but we needed to simplify things a little bit and get some of the species and anatomy differences um, out of this. And so what we did was we switched to cryo infarcts. Um, these are popular among people who do stem cell research because they create a nice wound margin. So when you find a cell that's, my, that's in the infarct, you know that that's one of the ones that, that is really in the infarct. You can tell where the border is. Um, but we use these uh, to make infarcts of defined shapes si and sizes and locations on the heart. So these are little stainless steel tubes with porous metal tips welded into the end. And we fill these with liquid nitrogen. We can hold these against the heart surface. The nitrogen wicks out the pores. It keeps the, the tip very, very cold. Um, and so we can, we can create an infarct that, that kills the entire thickness of the rat heart right to the endocardial surface uh, in about 30 to 40 seconds of contact. And if we use the rectangular tip, we get an elliptical shaped infarct more like the shape we had seen in the pigs. If we use the circular tip, then we get a circular infarct more like uh, what we had typically seen in the standard rat model. And then, of course, we can vary the location. So the basic design on this study um, was to make all three shapes of infarct, so a elliptical, circular, and then elliptical turned um, the non-physiologic direction near the equator of the heart. So this is basically the, the one on the left, the longitudinal ellipse, is basically a, a pig infarct in a rat, if you will. Um, and then circular infarcts at the apex that are more comparable to what you normally get by ligating a coronary artery in the rat. And what we found um, is that what determines the mechanics in these different infarcts is the location of the infarct. So all of the infarcts that were located near the equator of the heart stretch circumferentially. 
um, and the ones that were that involved the apex stretched in both directions. Uh, and sure enough, the structure of the scars that forms follows the mechanics. So all of these equatorial infarcts that are stretching primarily in the circumferential direction create aligned collagen as we had seen in the pigs that I showed you at the start. And the ones that involve the apex are stretching in both directions, uh, and they get much less organized collagen that leads to the isotropic mechanics. And this is just the quantification then, um, average histograms for each of those groups uh, at the mid wall of the heart. Uh, and so that's showing the alignment in the, in the groups that are at the equator and the, the isotropic distribution for the groups that are involved in the apex. All right. So now to the modeling. So at this point, we have a design goal. Um, we'd, we'd like to create highly anisotropic scar that's stiffer in the longitudinal direction. Um, we also know a little bit more about what happens in the natural course of healing, and that is that you get variable anisotropy depending on the regional mechanics. But I'll note here, I showed you rat and pig. People have also looked at this in dog and in sheep. Um, and also there's been some histologic, histologic and a little bit of mechanical study of human infarcts. Um, and no one has ever reported longitudinal anisotropy. Um, so what nature does is not what we think um, would be optimum for left ventricular function. And that brings up some interesting evolutionary arguments maybe we can have in the discussion. Um, and so, so we have a goal. Um, we know that's not what normally happens, and that means that we want to think about interventions that could direct uh, the scar to do what we want it to do instead of what it normally does. Um, and so that brings me to the, the, the idea of creating predictive models and using those to design the interventions. Um, so what goes into those predictive models? Uh, we know a lot about how fibroblasts behave, and in particular, I'm interested here in incorporating the effects of mechanical environment because we're seeing that the mechanical environment is so important uh, to the, the scar that forms. And so we know a lot about how um, fibroblasts behave and how they respond to different mechanical environments. There have been a lot of excellent in vitro uh, studies in collagen gels and in other cell culture systems. I'm going to show you a couple here, a little bit of a commercial, I guess, because I'll show you a couple that our group happened to do. Um, but there's lots of good work like this out there. Um, this was a study that came out recently um, where we showed that mechanical loading does directly accelerate cell migration uh, along the direction of mechanical load. So this is one where we loaded transverse to a wound uh, and tracked migration into that wound and showed that that loading in the direction the cells are migrating does accelerate the migration um, compared to loading perpendicular to the migration direction. Um, we also showed in fibroblast populated collagen gels um, that it's actually the loading that comes first. So in a lot of these collagen gel experiments, people had attributed cell alignment to contact guidance. So basically that the cells compact the gel, which they do, and they align the collagen, and then that collagen alignment becomes the, the cue for the cell alignment. But what we actually found is that it's a little bit the other way around, um, that if you, if you let um, a, a set, so this is, this is showing, uh, this curve here is showing alignment um, of the, the fibroblasts in a collagen gel. And so if you let them align in response to a uniaxial load, the cells will align and the collagen will align. Um, and then if you switch the direction of loading 90 degrees, um, what actually happens is that the cells reorient first uh, and then they begin remodeling the collagen. So the cells can directly sense the load and reorient in response to the load. So the load can affect the migration. It can affect cell alignment. Um, it also affects collagen remodeling in a number of ways. Um, these are collagen ger gel experiments that Steve Thomopoulos, who's on the call with us, um, did when he was a postdoc in my group, um, where we basically showed uh, that if we load uh, fibroblast populated collagen gels and don't allow the cells to to generate any new collagen, um, what the cells will try and do is compact the collagen. And as they compact it, if the, if the gel is loaded, this is a little loading system that we used for these gels, if the gel is loaded biaxially, that's on the top right, then um, the gel will thin, but in the plane, the collagen fiber structure will remain random as it originally polymerized. Um, if you load, preferentially in one direction, then the cells are able to polymerize in the perpendicular direction and by, and, and sorry, compact in the perpendicular direction. And as they compact, they generate net fiber alignment just by rearranging the fibers that were there. Um, and so if we look at distributions, we can, we can get from the biaxial loading, you get a random distribution from the uniaxial loading, we get aligned collagen. And in fact, the, the mechanical difference when we then test these gels, um, the biaxially 
uh, constrained gels have a random structure and they're mechanically isotropic. And the uniaxially constrained gels that we were making at that time had, a, had an anisotropy. The absolute stiffness is much, much lower, but the degree of anisotropy is pretty similar to what we saw in some of those pig infarcts, actually. Um, so this is one of many ways that the cells can, can manipulate matrix to generate alignment in the direction of a load. Um, here's another one, some great work um, by Yanas. Um, in the 70s, showing that uh, the degradation of collagen in response to a collagenase is also strain dependent. So that simply placing collagen under load, a collagen network under load in one direction will protect fibers in that direction from degradation while perpendicular fibers um, degrade. And so that's another way, a little cartoon here where the perpendicular fibers are degrading. It's another way to end up with collagen that's preferentially aligned in the direction of a load because you sacrifice collagen that's aligned in a perpendicular direction. All right, so I'll stop with reviewing. I could go on like this. There are so many of these studies. There are a lot of these behaviors um, that are known. And what we decided to do to try and synthesize some of these behaviors um, was to create an agent-based model of infarct healing. And so, so there had been a model, an agent-based model of skin wound healing, um, which was the taking off point for us. We were inspired by this one. And the basic idea is to model every single fibroblast um, and track those fibroblasts as they crawl around and allow them to do the behaviors that they do uh, and prescribe the likelihood of them responding in certain ways based on the in vitro studies that we already have. Um, and so, so we're going to um, let these migrate around. Um, they're going to proliferate, proliferate, sorry, apoptose. We're going to track the position, orientation, and speed. Um, and I'll say a bit more about this. We're going to incorporate a bunch of different cues that we know are affecting migration and alignment in the cells. At the same time, we're going to track the matrix everywhere. And so here, the little fiber directions are showing the mean direction of the fibers. And the colors in this picture are showing density of the matrix as it's being remodeled. Um, and so as the cells move around, uh, the existing matrix can get degraded. They can remodel uh, the orientation of the fibers, which simulates the compaction that we talked about in the collagen gels. They can deposit new collagen fibers. Um, and, uh, and then a little bit more about the integration. So, so we know that these cells are going to respond to a series of different cues. Um, certainly the prominent ones include the mechanical load, which is mostly what we've been talking about today, um, contact guidance from the extracellular matrix, chemokine gradients, which orient and direct the cells. Um, and then there's also this idea of persistence um, in cell migration, that cells will persist in the, in the direction that they're already headed. Um, and so we're able to determine these different cues, and we basically uh, represent them as vectors. So for example, an easy way to get a vector from a concentration is to integrate that concentration over the cell surface, the local chemokine concentration. Um, and then that, that integral, if uh, the concentration is the same everywhere, you get the zero vector. And if it's much bigger on one side than the other, you get a vector that's oriented in the direction of the greatest concentration. Um, and so, so for all of these different responses, um, migration speeds, their, their response to each of these individual cues, we had really good independent in vitro data. So almost all the parameters in the agent-based model, all the what people normally would call rules in one of these models, are determined from independent data. What we really didn't have is we wanted to take some sort of weighted average of the cues in order to determine what the net response will be when there are multiple conflicting cues. And this is where there's not a lot of data. Um, there were some good studies where uh, people compared contact guidance and persistence in cell migration. So we could get a relative weighting of those two parameters. Um, but we didn't have a way to get good relative weightings of chemical versus mechanical versus contact guidance. Um, and so as an initial first pass, we just set the weighting of those cues equal to one another um, for, for lack of any information um, saying that that's not what happens. All right, so, so this turns out the model has in the, on the order of 20 parameters, um, and, and these were the only ones that, that we had to guess. All the rest of them are, um, are taken from literature from these in vitro studies. And so we turn this thing, this thing loose, uh, and what we see 
is that the cells begin to, to crawl in um, and they start depositing matrix. So you can see that the matrix is getting denser here. And in this particular case, we're simulating um, an initial uh, direction of alignment that was fairly strong, simulating a layer of myocardium, which does uh, initially have fibers and matrix oriented in one direction. Uh, and then this is equal biaxial stretch. Uh, and so actually what's happening is the, the collagen direction is getting more random over time as more and more collagen is deposited that's influenced by, um, by the mechanics in addition to the pre-existing matrix. So I always say that this is the day that I should have retired, um, which is that uh, we, we fitted the, the collagen accumulation um, curve, so basically the, the ratio of deposition and degradation, um, to collagen accumulation data that we had from our, our rat ligation study. Um, but then we predicted without any other fitting, just based on that assumption that the weights of the cues are equal and all the in vitro parameters that we had obtained, um, we predicted what we thought the orientation histogram should be for one of our cryoinfarcts that was healing at the equator with the under uniaxial stretch. Um, and, and we got this model curve compared to this data on our first try at predicting this, um, which I thought was really phenomenal. Um, and to sort of reinforce the point that we actually made in the cryoinfarct study, if we turn just the mechanosensitivity off but keep the sensitivity to chemokine gradients and contact guidance from pre-existing matrix, um, then we're not able to reproduce the anisotropy uh, that we saw in those studies, which is consistent with our experimental results. Um, we were, I apologize for this horrible slide. I will try and explain this thing. Um, we, we also uh, were able to explain some results from our prior pig studies that had baffled us until now. So basically, in the, the pig, uh, these open circles on the left are, there's normally a transmural gradient in muscle fiber and collagen uh, distribution. So you start at about minus 60 um, on the epicardial surface, pass through circumferential at the mid wall, and then end up at about plus 60 uh, on the endocardial surface. And when, uh, when we looked at those averages, in the pig, we saw that there was still a transmural gradient, but it wasn't nearly as steep. And then we also saw, and I had pointed this out, I think, in one prior slide, that the, the degree of alignment was much, much stronger at the mid wall and less strong at the edges. Um, so our model did exactly this when we ran it. Um, which allowed us to, I think, finally understand why we had gotten this data. We really hadn't understood it before. And, and the reason is really on the next slide, which is it turns out that in the mid wall in the pigs, the two main cues that are determining the orientation of the collagen are in co acting in concert with one another. So in these pigs, we were seeing stretching in the circumferential direction, so at zero degrees. And at the mid wall, the initial muscle fibers and extracellular matrix were also oriented in the circumferential direction. And so in that case, the two cues reinforce one another, and we end up maintaining that same circumferential orientation and getting very strong alignment in that layer. At the outer and inner layers, what's happening is that the, the contact guidance cue from the pre-existing matrix is pointing at minus 60, and the mechanical cue from the stretching that we measured is circumferential. So in this case, those two cues are conflicting. And what happens over time is that they gradually strike an average, um, and the longer this goes on, the more of the collagen is degraded and replaced, the closer this will eventually get to the direction of the mechanical cue. But we happened to look at about at three weeks in the pigs. And so we happen to catch this about halfway between where it started and where it's going to end up. And so um, th this arrow is showing that we had gotten about halfway from minus 60 to zero, and we'd gotten about halfway from plus 60 to zero. And so that explains why we saw a reduced transmural gradient, but it was still present. And it also explains why our degree of alignment was much less at the surfaces, because there, two conflicting cues um, were acting and trying to tell the cell to do two different things and so we get much less alignment of the collagen. All right, so um, the things we've talked about today were establishing a design goal, understanding the natural history, 
and then developing a model that can predict the basic features of what's going to happen in one of these healing scars um, where we have not only contact guidance and chemokine gradients but also the mechanical signals that are so important in a healing infarct. And now I just wanted to show you just a couple of ideas of future work of, about how we're beginning to use these models. I think we're just we're now finally at a position where we understand this well enough and have that understanding encapsulated in quantitative models so that we can use those agent-based models to develop develop and to computationally screen some ideas for interventions to try and figure out how we get from what we normally get to what we would like to have. And then the advantage of um, testing some of these model design interventions, of course, is that the results of those experiments provide really nice feedback to the model to continue developing and refining it. Um, Here's a really simple historical example that um, once we saw this was, uh, I think, a little bit of a head slapper. Um, this again repeats the collagen accumulation curve um, that we had fitted in our model, so these parameters are fitted. Um, and on the right-hand side is a prediction for what would happen if we treated um, early on, starting early on with an MMP inhibitor. So metalloprotease inhibitors um, have been tested for a number of different applications, but there was a phase about 10 years ago um, where there was a little flurry of tests in post-infarction healing uh, in animal models. And the idea was that if you could preserve more of the initial collagen during the first necrotic phase of the infarct, that you might somehow end up with a stronger infarct or a better infarct. Um, I'm not sure the, the goal was entirely clear, but, but people were interested in, in preserving preserving some of the initial collagen. Um, what was interesting is almost all of the experiments, so there were a number of transgenic mice that were built, there were a number of uh, pharmaceutical companies that tested agents, almost all of the experiments stopped in the first week. Um, and, and one of the, the basic things about the, the collagen turnover in any of these models is the rate at which the MMPs are degrading the collagen depends both on the amount of MMP that you have and also on the amount of collagen that is there for the MMP to degrade. Um, and because collagen deposition doesn't really get going until the last, the end of the first week after an infarction, really by one week, there hasn't been an opportunity for an MMP inhibitor to have much effect because there hasn't been much collagen degradation yet. Um, there's very little collagen present at that time to degrade. Um, and so our, our model would predict that really if you want to see an effect of an intervention like this, you're going to have to wait six weeks or so um, before you could see a real effect of MMP inhibitors. And as I mentioned, all, all the studies that concluded that MMP inhibition didn't work basically stopped after the first week. Um, and so this is a very simple example of how incorporating some of the quantitative of behaviors in a model can help you think maybe a little more clearly about what the right experiment is to, to test a hypothesis. Um, we're interested now as we think about drug therapies in, in integrating the next level of complexity about how these drugs actually work. So at the moment, the fibroblast behaviors that I told you about in our agent-based model are essentially phenomenologic. The fibroblasts are told to do in the model what they actually do in the same experiment in a, or the same situation in an in vitro experiment. Um, really to understand some of the complexity of the drugs that we use post-infarction and how a new therapy would affect those. Um, so, so some of these things like angiotensin, um, patients are all going to be on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Um, and we talked about MMP inhibitors, right? So that's the, something that um, is, a, is a product of uh, a couple of cell types that are in the infarct. So really in order to understand how we're impacting overall collagen turnover and fibrosis signaling, what we'd like to do is integrate this with signaling network models um, that can predict the effect of multiple drugs and interventions and can integrate those at the cellular level with the effects of stretch. And so this is something that we've begun doing with Jeff Sosserman, one of the systems biology faculty here at UVA. Um, he's done extensive network modeling of this type for beta adrenergic signaling in myocytes and also for hypertrophy in myocytes, but we're just now building one of these for uh, fibrosis signaling in cardiac fibroblasts so that we can integrate this with a bunch of data um, and uh, be able to predict the response of different drugs at the cellular level, integrate that into the agent-based model to predict the, level, the effects at the tissue level. Uh, similarly, Guy mentioned CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, in his introduction. Um, a number of devices, including surgical restraint, but also cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is a pacing strategy to alter the timing of contraction in different regions of the heart. The, these are often used in patients who have uh, prior myocardial infarcts. It's often the reason that they have heart failure and are a candidate uh, for these therapies. And in that case, 
the situation obviously gets much more complicated and a multi-scale approach is required. Um, certainly we can predict from changes in local mechanics as a result of one of these therapies what we think is going to happen to the scar, but at the same time those changes in mechanics are also affecting what happens to the rest of the myocardium which will grow and remodel in the rest of the heart. These two together are determining pump function of the heart and then the pump function integrates with the circulation which has built-in reflexes to try and maintain blood pressure uh, in order to determine things like levels of beta adrenergic stimulation uh, in the that are and hormones that are circulating uh, that then feed back to affect hypertrophy and signaling in the fibroblasts. Um, so, so really to understand some of these more sophisticated device therapies and certainly how they combine with drugs, then we're having to go to these multi-scale approaches where we integrate with finite element and, and models of the circulation. And then since Steve is on the call, I thought I'd mention one more thing um, that we've been doing uh, with Steve. We got an NSF grant with Steve as a collaborator to start to, to look at some of these same questions now in tendon. And really the motivation for this um, was some work that Steve did when he was a postdoc in the lab where we did some of the collagen gel experiments I showed you with fibroblasts that were isolated from heart. And, and side by side, we did the same experiments with fibroblasts that were isolated from tendons of the same animals. Um, and we saw that the behavior of the fibroblasts from the different organs was really identical uh, in terms of their response in, in aligning collagen, remodeling collagen. Uh, in these in vitro systems, and, and then this is uh, something that we went and fished out from the literature. One of my students um, found the degree of alignment in response to cyclic strain, this is on stretchable membranes, of again a whole bunch of different cell types across a range of different experiments. And this is actually not only dermal fibroblasts from human and rat, also mesenchymal smooth, um, or mesenchymal uh, stem cells, sorry, and even aortic endothelial cells, surprisingly. And the strength of alignment, um, it, this response curve is really remarkably similar across a huge range of cell types. Um, and so we think that some of the basic modeling principles that are in the aging-based model, some of these responses are robust enough that we should be able to use the models to think about scar formation in other mechanically loaded environments like tendon. And so, so we've started working with Steve to try and understand something um, that his group has found, which is this interesting trend where these bars are roughly in order of increasing load placed on healing tendons. Um, and basically, increasing the load does increase the cross-sectional area of the tendon, so it seems to increase the amount of collagen that you deposit it, net collagen deposition, um, but it doesn't monotonically increase the strength or the alignment uh, of the collagen that you deposit. And so because we've been so interested in collagen alignment, um, we're trying to use our aging-based model to, to look at and better understand this and to devise some, uh, some better maybe physical therapy regimens for, um, for these healing tendons. That's all I have to say today. I wanted to acknowledge uh, a number of people in the group. The people who are underlined are the ones whose data you actually saw um, today in the presentation. Gaurav Alawadi is the surgeon that I worked with on the patch experiment. Jeff Saucerman I mentioned. Um, the CRT work uh, at, with the multi-scale modeling um, of the left ventricle and growth of the left ventricle is something we've been doing with the group at UC San Diego. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, Steve's work as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to go out of full screen mode so that I can see everyone, um, and uh, hopefully we have left plenty of time for some discussion. So J Jeff, maybe, maybe I can ask you a question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Um, so w one of the things that always puzzled me is the, um, the fact that that slide you showed at the end where many different cell types uh, responded similarly and along this, this uh, sort of range of strain. But physiologically, there's such an enormous range of strains that, that these different cell types may be exposed to from, you know, say, micro strains in, in the bone to, uh, you know, single digit level percent strain for the tendon to double digit percent strain in, in some other tissues. So uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around that, the concept that uh, the, the the levels or the the magnitude of strains that these cells see are so different from tissue to tissue. Yet the responses in an isolated system um, are, are very similar. Do you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I mean, it really makes you wonder um, what the cells are that we're testing in vitro. 
<laughs> At least that's what it makes me wonder, right? Um, it, it's a provocative slide, I think, for for that reason. Um, you know, we worry about this a lot more, for example, in myocytes. When you isolate neonatal myocytes, they take apart their entire contractile apparatus, right, every sarcomere, and then they put it all back together again once they're on the dish. And so you have to feel that the, the cell that you get once, once it's on the dish is just a fundamentally different cell than the cell that you took out, right? Um, and I'm probably not the best person in terms of the cell mechanics, certainly not even the best person on this call um, to say what the analogy of that is when you, when you isolate um, fibroblasts and other mesenchymal cells um, in terms of, of their cytoskeleton. Um, I, I I've always thought that, that some of that similarity in the alignment response is basically the stuff that people like Roland Countess are modeling when they make their, their actin stress fiber models, right? That basically those things sort of adjust to whatever new level of, of tension you, you, you put them in. And then from that new set point, right, then they show strain avoidance to a certain magnitude of strain that basically has to do with the rate of turnover of the actin stress fibers. And so I've always thought that the similarity of the different responses in that slide was basically because all these cells have, an, have actin stress fibers in culture and you're basically looking at that same phenomenon in a bunch of different cells. Um, but I think the point you're raising is a really good one, which is, you know, for how many of those cells is that at all representative of what they're doing in your body? Does, speaking of what these cells do in the body, what about electrophysiologic effects that, that, that go on in, in uh, say, cardiac resynchronization therapy? So, you, so you, you have a great set of models to predict how, the, how an infarct will, uh, will evolve during resynchronization therapy. Is there expected to be much feedback between the uh, electrical and mechanical effects as they as the, as fibers begin to align. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Peter Cole, who's a, a cardiac fibroblast electrical person, who says basically all we need is we need infarct scar to conduct better and ablation scar to conduct worse. <laughs> and and I think he makes a really good point that a lot of the danger of a myocardial infarct is actually an electrophysiological danger, right? Many of these people die from arrhythmias, um, and so and many of them end up with implantable defibrillators to prevent that death. Um, and so the the question is how much of that risk of arrhythmia is is due to sort of the shape of the infarct and its interactions at the border, which is I think what's received most of the attention, um, and how much is due to um, to propagation through the infarct, which I think is less common. So I think by itself, the scar collagen fiber alignment is probably not critical to the electrophysiology problem. What becomes much more interesting is if we start to regenerate, right? So once you start putting some stem cells in there and the stem cells start to become myocytes, the alignment of those myocytes, I think, is going to be determined by contact guidance from the collagen that surrounds them, right? And so that's where I actually think that being able to control the collagen alignment may be the prerequisite to getting regenerated myocardium that is not arrhythmogenic. Fascinating. And if I could uh, ask one follow-on question to that, how much conduction does occur across uh, across collagen? Collagen itself is electrically responsive, right? And th does th does the uh, alignment of the collagen itself affect the electrophysiology in any substantial way? The people who know a lot more about the electrophysiology than me say no. Um, that basically you don't get conduction across the scar, that when they do find conduction that, that goes through the region, it's, it's traveling through some endocardially spared myocardium, for example, in some cases. Um, but again, I think that's, that's what Peter Cole has been talking about, engineering the fibroblast to allow electrical conduction as a way of getting rid of some of the arrhythmogenic um, uh, risk of that scar tissue. And so there's an idea that you could make it conductive, um, but in its native state, it's, it's n you're normally not seeing conduction across the, the scar. Uh, this is Jeff Weiss. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Uh, wonderful hey. talk. I, I had a question for you. You had mentioned uh, you know, uh, contact guidance and, and um, strain um, as uh, uh, stimuli that might um, 
that that would uh, influence the direction and 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 rate of growth of the cells. Um, but one of your actually, I think a, a great paper that you published quite a while ago that was covered in your talk was related to um, the multi-axial testing when you showed that the the relative stiffness that the cells see. Um, is, is one of the major factors that kind of controls their, their, their outgrowth as well. So in other words, um, kind of a, contrib a contribution from both the local material properties of, of the tissue surrounding it and then of course the boundary conditions. So, mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about how to integrate these different um, factors together. So, you know, we, we talked, um, you know, Steve mentioned um, strain magnitude um, and then you talked about contact guidance. And then um, there's this issue of relative stiffness. And it seems like all of these factors will, will definitely influence, you know, directionality and rate of growth. And somehow we have to kind of um, weight them, so to speak. Yeah, and it's this integration, right, that I think is the is the most fun. And so, so when we were integrating different signals in the model, um, that one slide that I showed here, we, we literally just represented each one as a vector and then did a vector sum. Um, a weighted vector sum as a first pass at trying to capture is that reasonable or not. Um, and in the few cases where we had data where someone had tried to expose a cell to two conflicting cues and then see how that cell population responds, um, th those are consistent with the small amount of data that's out there. Um, those data include um, some some pre-aligned uh, collagen experiments um, from Bob Tranquillo and Victor Barocas a ways back, and then more recently a bunch of microgroove experiments where people have different cells that have a topographical cue from microgrooves and then a mechanical cue from stretch, um, and all of those seem to consistently show that that you get a response that's somewhere in the middle of the two conflicting cues that you set up and that has a magnitude that's kind of consistent with this vector averaging idea. That's where we came up with that. Um, but I think you're asking um, a couple of, of more sophisticated questions and I think the boundary conditions are particularly interesting here. Um, and that's where coupling the agent-based model to a finite element model of the tissue mechanics I think is really the only way to effectively get now, which is what we're working on, to get at the boundary conditions. And, and I'll give you one example of where the boundary conditions are important, I think. Um, in the collagen gels, all that alignment that we were getting in the collagen gels is really, it arises from compaction. Right? And a collagen gel is free to do that because it's not a very dense tissue and it's completely unloaded in the transverse direction in those experiments. Right? But in a beating heart, even my infarcts that were stretching primarily in one direction are, still have significant load on them in the perpendicular direction. And so one of the things that we haven't been able to figure out is um, can you even get the equivalent of collagen gel type compaction in a healing infarct? Right? Um, I believe it in a tendon maybe where you've got uniaxial, in a situation where you've got uniaxial load and no transverse load or little transverse load, but in the heart there's biaxial load all the time and so it's really hard to imagine um, how you could get uh, that kind of compaction or you could get alignment by a compaction and those kinds of boundary condition effects um, I think we can only get when we couple this thing to a finite element model. I don't know if that answers your question, Jeff. Yeah, actually that, that helps a lot. Yeah, I just, uh, I've, I've struggled with this integration myself and we've taken kind of a similar approach to what you've done where we basically do kind of a weighted vector sum of those things and um, you know I think there's still more experiments that really need to be done and I wonder how much of the results of those experiments will be very much uh, cell and tissue specific as well so I just well, that's kind of that I think that's a major advantage of having these models in the first place right is you can design experiments to break the model um, right. and, and see what happens. And so that, that's really kind of the fun phase for us is it took us a little while to get the model up and running, but now um, we're, we're, doing, we're back to cyclic stretching of collagen gels after not having done collagen gel work for a while. And it's because we finally have um, questions that we think are intelligent questions to ask from those experiments because we can make specific predictions from the model um, and then try and test those predictions. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that will be a, a good use of, uh, of the model. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, have I have two questions. Um, first of all, I'm looking from an alternative point of view. Uh, how much of your code is reusable? This is one thing. The second thing is I'm looking specifically uh, what this model can do for other purposes, maybe than uh, research-wise. So, uh, for example, can your model predict the probability of dying after a uh, myocardial infarction? <laughs> This is important because actually now they are looking at uh, specifically next month the monthly challenge for diabetic populations. They are looking for 
probability of death after each complication. If you can give some insight into this in detail, code is so usable, but it's something to be done. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I am, am behind in posting the, the code from the journal physiology paper on our lab website, um, which is not for a lack of willingness. So if anybody wants a copy of the code, please email me and I'll send it to you. But we'll, we'll get it up on the website soon. So the, the agent-based modeling code is um, in MATLAB and it, it's quite fast. Um, so, so that's easy for somebody to run and then link to something else um, for any purpose that you want. Um, in terms of the probability of dying after a heart attack, this is actually a fascinating question that we're separately working on. Um, and and it in my opinion, it requires that full multi-scale diagram that I showed you that has not only the scar and the muscle, but also the whole heart and the reflexes. Um, because what we're seeing um, in the literature and thinking about right now is that the, the thing that changes the most between patients whose infarct is big enough to kill them and who's not big enough to kill them after they survive the, the initial half an hour, which is basically electrophysiology. From a mechanics point of view, the thing that causes catastrophic failure, um, it, it actually has to do with the reflex response. Um, and so, so I don't think you can predict that from a tissue level alone or even from an organ level alone. I think you have to include the hemodynamic reflexes to have a shot at predicting um, which ones are going to be fatal. Okay, I, I was, <laughs> you just have to make a threat to the system and then it starts working. Kind of like my kids. The, the so, can you just kind of close this out perhaps with, with, uh, with your thoughts on the degree of, uh, of, of uh, therapeutic effect that you think we could achieve through, uh, the, through cardiac resynchronization therapy. So, at, are, are there going to be limits to the size of, uh, of infarcts that are going to be, uh, that, that could be addressed with this? Do you think it's going to be possible eventually to really guide uh, reseeding of, of cardiomyocytes? If, uh, if, you really are, if you are able to fully predict the evolution of a scar, where will that leave us clinically? Yep. So, so the resynchronization therapy um, is, you know, is working in about 70% of the patients that that they select for it. They have pretty good selection criteria. Um, a lot of the people that it doesn't work in have infarcts, and so that's kind of our interest in the cardiac resynchronization therapy. Is it seems to be a seems to having an infarct seems to defeat the approach of cardiac resynchronization therapy um, for reasons that are not uh, fully understood. Um, and so I think that's part of what we still don't understand, and why we were particularly interested in targeting cardiac resynchronization therapy in patients um, who have an infarct. Um, this isn't a very sexy thing to say because this is about designing new SCAR and, um, and, and I do think there's real potential to, to design SCAR that, that has the mechanical properties that you want um, and, and so I'm excited about doing that. But I actually think that maybe the most important use of a model like this, if, if I can get people to use it, is, is as a screening tool so that you don't accidentally do stuff you shouldn't do. Um, and, and so, so one of the most famous trials of a post-infarction therapy is from the 50s. Um, somebody figured out that steroids decrease infarct size, and everyone would like to have a smaller infarct. Um, and so they showed that in animals, and then they did a clinical trial in people, and they had to stop the trial after I think it was 12 patients, because three or four of the first patients died of catastrophic infarct rupture. Um, and so then they went back and did much more extensive studies and learned that any anti-inflammatory that you give in the first few days, steroids, um, ibuprofen, indomethacin, all kinds of different anti-inflammatories promote infarct rupture, right? And so, so one of the things that I'm worried about here is that several of the therapies that are out, including surgical restraint, which we've been working on, but it relieves load from the infarct, something called peri-infarct pacing, where they're intentionally pacing right next to the infarct, all of these change the mechanics of the scar. And, it, and I think the f first most important thing is to be able to screen those to make sure none of those are going to weaken the scar. So I, I do think there are really exciting long-term opportunities to, to design new scar and to create a substrate 
so that when you put your stem cells in it, the myocytes will turn out the way you want them to. And so that, that's clearly, you know, our biggest sales pitch for the stuff that we're doing. But I, I don't think we should undersell the screening because I think one of the problems with a lot of the, the therapies that people are working on right now is there's just no way to pre-screen to make sure something bad isn't going to happen um, before you get too far down the path of clinical trials. Um, and I, I think that that's a really important practical advantage of models like this that um, that maybe has been, may, maybe I, I haven't been selling that aspect hard enough, but I think it's really practically important. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. This is really exciting technology with a lot of promise. This is, and thank you very much for taking a moment to, uh, to deliver this NIH, uh, NSF, MSM uh, webinar. Hi, Meg. And I'm Meg. I'm sorry. And, and Grace Pung in general. So, so th this, this concludes the webinar. Thank you very much, Jeff. Our next uh, event will be at the World Congress for um, Biomechanics in Boston. We have a series of of uh, of symposia there, and then we're also going to be getting together uh, this fall at NIH for for a continuation of this discussion. Thanks very much to all of us, all of you for joining us, and thank you, Grace, for hosting this. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jeff.